Zulok, the deck created by Raynad. Or did he? He may have converted the archetype to Hearthstone, but Zoo actually started in Magic the Gathering nearly a decade earlier, before Hearthstone was even released. The name came from the unique entourage of creatures, from apes to cats to goblins, oh my. But the question still stands, how well did this deck perform from inception, and how did it do into early expansions? This video will be encompassing how Zulok performed in the three earliest eras, Classic, Curse of Naxxramas, and Goblins vs Gnomes. In my previous reports, I've done Classic as one unified portion of discussion, but fortunately, I have the luxury of finding data before Classic format took shape. Only one phrase could describe such a period, an unorganized mess. You know the period right after an expansion, when absolutely no one knows the meta? Imagine that, but without years of card evaluating experience. Any concept of a standard list was wildly dependent on who you asked, and the community had to resort to a spray and pray tactic to see what worked. But through trial and error, two hits suggested further layers of viability, Swarm and Murloc Warlock. Contrary to initial belief, Zoo and Swarm are actually different styles, whereas one attempted to control the board from start to finish, Swarm was more in the realm of playing cards that consisted of multiple bodies to rush opponents down. With that potential misconception in mind, let's truly begin. Swarm took the very black and white philosophy of shoving every minion that created more minions, which left little room for anything else. Suboptimal inclusions like Razorfin Hunter and Dragonling Mechanic were seen, whereas the present inclusions like Harvest Golem defined the token generation. Additionally, there were payoffs for these token generators like Raid Leader, Frostwolf Warlord, and Power Overwhelming. Finally, removal, like Soulfire and Siphon Soul? Like I said, an unorganized mess defined this era, so aggro players looked towards another unifying concept. Next in line was Murloc Warlock, which is likely the most famous aggro deck of this era, but has since faded to a niche pick in the current classic meta. Why? Well, even something with limited potential could be perceived as special against decks with even more limited potential. Throw in every Murloc and pay off to reflect that ideal and let it rip. These cards included Murloc Warleader and Old Murkai. The same Swarm Principle applies here, capable of turn 5 kills even this early in the meta. Warleader kept the deck at the perceived top of the meta, but what happened when one didn't draw it? What this archetype lacked was consistency. Without Warleader, the minions Murloc Warlock would play were subpar as the meta began to catch up to it. Finally, Classic Zoo. Around this time is when the best Warlock early game minion package was discovered. They didn't have the overall highs of Murloc Warleader, but what this deck did have was the best early game Classic Hearthstone could offer. Flame Imp, Voidwalker, Young Priestess, Argent Squire, Abusive Sergeant, and Lepernome comprised the one drop package. Of these, two were of the highest quality. Flame Imp was a 3-2 body for 1 mana that had the privilege of being able to tackle 2 or 3 drops, making the damage taken from playing it of little consequence, and Voidwalker's 3 health with Taunt for 1 protected the subsequent 2 drops. Speaking of these 2 drops, 3 were played, but unlike the 1 drops that focused on power alone, these 2 drops made certain the 1 drops could make an even greater impact. Night Juggler, provided RNG was on your side, made the difference between a destroyed Flame Imp and a Flame Imp that could do another 3 damage. With Voidwalker, they were a match made in heaven, and with Direwolf Alpha, Voidwalker was effectively a 2-3 for 1 mana. But that wasn't the only synergy. It could also be used with Divine Shield, thanks to Argent Squire, or be a way to buff every card on the field if you use multiple one drops to trade into a large minion. These buffs were the second of the triumphant pillars, along with Direwolf Alpha, Young Priestess, and Shattered Sun Cleric also performed this role. But like the one drop discussion, two buffs should be discussed here. Defender of Argus gave any minion to perform Voidwalker's role, which meant all the more opportunity for Juggler or Direwolf to perform the role. An abusive sergeant buff meant one drops could trade into three or four drops. Then, the final part of the triumphant pillars, the late game, 
What's important to keep in mind for this section was despite Zoo's appearance of an aggro deck, it was actually a reactive minion control deck. If you played against control or some mid-range, it would absolutely be the aggressor, but against aggro, rather than relying on removal alone like control warrior does, its form of control would come in seizing control of the board to either press the advantage or stave off damage. Often Zoo by turn 4 or 5 would have an empty hand, which played into what the deck had in mind perfectly. Its late game win con wasn't a Ragnaros or an Alexstrasza, but it was the hero power. During these turns, Warlock would use Life Tap to play two threats every single turn, meaning it realistically could keep up against mid-range archetypes despite the lower curve. There was also a reason why Blizzard was initially so afraid of Life Tap, and with a more powerful core set, Warlock would have dominated the meta on this hero power alone. But this wasn't the only advantage of having Empty Hand on turn 4 or 5. Try Doomguard or Soulfire for size, serving as a removal or burst damage. They would often be played when the discard downside had no effect, making their already outrageous rates seem like an oversight by Blizzard themselves. Under these three defining traits, Zulok thrived as a skill-based aggro deck and was often the most used archetype when trying to reach legend quickly. Its numerous players led to some to try other inclusions. These ranged based on preference. Fairy Dragon and Scarlet Crusader were good minions, Power Overwhelming and Dark Iron Dwarf served as additional buffs, and Utility provided by cards like Elven Archer to pick off one-drops, Iron Beak Owl for silence, Hellfire to lean into the control element, and Acidic Swamp Boost for weapon removal. However, with all the praise I have given it over this review, if a deck becomes a preferred way to climb to Legend quickly, people will naturally use that statistic as a way to climb themselves via queuing counters. The most egregious of these being Freeze Mage. With its multitude of board clears, it could use Life Tap's damage to burst with Fireballs and Frost Bolts. Handlock was similar. Pick your poison, lose to board clears like Hellfire or Shadowflame, or die to a crackback of double zero mana 80 giants taunted. Finally, Miracle Rogue, which thanks to its cheap removal and insane tempo could realistically keep up with Zulok, and Life Tap made it all the much easier to get Leroy comboed. Now, the positive matchups. Combo Druid, Sunshine Hunter, Burn Mage, Aggro Paladin, Priest, Aggro Rogue, and Midrange Shaman. All of these are really good, but having losing matchups against Miracle Rogue and only an even matchup against Control Warrior made this tiering difficult. If you were climbing to Legend, Tier 2 was Zoo's Domain. If you were already at Legend, Tier 3. Damn. The reputation of Fast Legend continued into Curse of Naxxramas, but how that Legend was achieved differed from Zoo to Zoo. Unlike the other archetypes, which cherry-picked one or two new cards, Zoo was able to take advantage of the whopping 6 new cards, nearly 20% of the 30. We'll go over each of them where it's appropriate, specifically week by week. What do I mean? Well, Naxxramas experimented with releasing cards every single week rather than all at once. This had its benefits and downsides, but with that in mind, week 1, the Arachnid Quarter. Haunted Creeper was an absolutely nuts 2-drop and would only move out of the public eye with the shift to wild. It provided a sticky death rattle, token fodder for buff cards, and overall above average stats. What more could you possibly want? And Nerubian Egg, thanks to buff cards like Defender of Argus and now standard power overwhelming, made it the zero attack irrelevant. 2 mana 4-4. Four, four. Thanks to these inclusions, Zoo became significantly more resilient to board wipes. Then Week 2's Play Quarter rolled around and introduced the single most long-standing meta card going 9 years strong, Lotheb, the 5 mana 5-5 five five that provided protection or tempo all in a single package. Although it wasn't essential to Zoo, it was still a worthwhile tech option to consider. Then Military Quarter bestowed Void Collar and single-handedly perpetuated an entire sub-archetype of decks who desired to cheat Lord Jaraxxus into play. In my Handlock video, I go into detail how this archetype was more Handlock than Zoo. However, that didn't mean it was exclusive to Handlock. Void Collar wasn't too bad at cheating Doom Guards either. For Zoo players, Void Collar offered a more conventional control win con, 
while not sacrificing the soul of the archetype. Now, the wing that likely defines all Naxxramas, the Construct Quarter and the Undertaker given from it. If what Voidcaller did was impressive, Undertaker did that with several classes, Hunter, Priest, and especially Warlock. Along with Zombie Chow, Undertaker's Zoo Warlock was one of the only archetypes that could take advantage of the numerous death rattles without sacrificing quad quality or game plan. Why was Undertaker so special? Three words, scalable, one drop. There's a reason why Blizzard doesn't create them often. They're powerful swing cards that often end the game if left unchecked. If you didn't mulligan your likely one answer, concede it now and save the time. And that type of play pattern isn't exactly the most fun. But for Zulok, who boy was it great. Good matchups galore, like Mage, Control Warrior, Midrange Paladin, Rogue, and Midrange Shaman. All prominent. Now, the bad matchups, two in particular. Handlock with its Shadow Flames, massive early game pressure, and new tools like Sludge Belcher made this matchup continue to be miserable. Then, the other high-end Undertaker deck, Hunter. With its superior minions, superior damage, and Unleash the Hounds, formed a game plan that entirely defined Naxxramas. But despite that status, Zulok wasn't too far behind one of the top decks in the metagame, which means it had to be pretty damn good, right? For the initial first month, Undertaker was the dominant force in the metagame, and Zulok would be damned to consider anything else. New death rattles like Clockwork Gnome and Piloted Treader also didn't help the community ease their stress that Undertaker may again dominate the meta expansion cycle. Rather than showing a list you've seen before, I found it worthwhile to include a list that was more unorthodox, the Return of Swarm from Classic. But instead of pure rush, Zixos, Zoo still wanted to control the board with far more optimized payoff at rank 1 Legend, specifically Sea Giant, which thanks to cards like Echoing Ooze, one or two giants was enough of a factor for opponents to worry about. Then there was Voidcaller, which could now finally take advantage of Malganus, giving Zulok effectively a better mountain giant. It was actually even more useful here than it was in Demon Handlock, since you could often have one or two demons on board that could take advantage of Malganus. Combined with Doomguard and an occasional Lord Jaraxxus, these late game demons were the dynamic few, combining an already terrifying aggressive package with an unfair element. Unfortunately, this version did suffer if Voidcaller wasn't drawn, or if the dynamic few weren't drawn, which was more of a problem than you may realize. You see, Demon Handlock had much more opportunity to draw these two cards together, because, well, Demon Handlock light taps so much more often. Even if Malganus wasn't drawn, opponents wouldn't be willing to risk due to the massive hand size, allowing for even greater time to draw either of the two. Voidcaller may have been more powerful here, but it was far less consistent. Then a month passed, and the inevitable happened. Undertaker was nerfed and Zulok reacted by returning to its roots for individually powerful one-drops. It was like the air cleared, and Zulok could now see another path forward. Zulok with a greater mid-range backbone. With Soulfire nerfed to one mana, it meant the deck had to rely on a new removal spell. Unfortunately, one that was just as infuriating as Soulfire. Implosion might be the quintessential bad RNG card, but in effect, at 3 or 4 damage was too powerful, much to the dismay of Warlock players. Life Tap was still the standard late game win con, yes, but now two new late game minions were now good enough that Life Tap could be used alongside it. Lothab and Dr. Boom. Dr. Boom in particular, which I continue to mention time and time again within my reports, as, well, the most powerful late game spell of early Hearthstone. Ahead or behind, it didn't matter. This was the most popular variant of Zulok, providing the deck with a 90% chance to create a strong curve early. This strong curve was enough to push the deck to the forefront of the meta, doing well against Combo Druid, Control Warrior, Midrange Paladin, Midrange Hunter, Tempo Mage, and Mech Mage. Unfortunately, it was this very strength that meant should this strategy be faced with just the right tools, it could often fall apart. What do I mean by this? Well, the decks that this deck lost to, it really lost to. Face Hunter and Fast Rogue could burst damage with little ability to respond, 
where Priest Control and Demon Handlock could wipe the board several times and outvalue them with superior late game threats. High tier 2 was the domain of Zulok at the expansion end, however, due to the bad matchups happening in waves, the deck could be as high as tier 1 or as low as tier 4. Despite being somewhat inconsistent, I would still call this deck good. I was more surprised at how much this deck moved in terms of tier list. Perhaps when it comes to iconic archetypes like this, we tend to see them far more idealistically. Make that what you will. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope to continue providing these explanations and ideally, when I get good enough at them, present other Hearthstone content as well.